much for all coming this evening to the 100th episode of the Squiggly Careers podcast. I think it's worth saying that when we started this two years ago, this is not what we planned at all. We were just two people sitting in our pyjamas, usually about 10 o'clock at night, talking to each other. I'm mainly thinking that about three people listened, one of which was pretty much definitely my mum, who is still our biggest fan. So, you know, she stuck with us. She stuck with us through uh, thick and thin. But we started it because I think we both felt, and I think lots of people around us felt, that work had changed. And the idea of climbing a career ladder, of a predictable linear career where we knew what was coming next, just seemed to have disappeared. And we were like, right, we're in this kind of whole new squiggly environment now, and what does that mean? And we could see that lots of people around us um, were kind of struggling. There was quite a lot of stress and anxiety, people feeling quite overwhelmed. But equally, we could spot that some people were thriving, finding more freedom and fulfilment in what they were doing. And what seemed to be the kind of common theme was the people who took ownership for their own career development, the people who'd got, were taking action, they got the kind of hints and tips and who were really thinking about what they wanted to do, what success meant for them. And so we were trying to do something that actually made that as accessible and as open to as many people as possible. And that was it really, just this idea of taking ownership for your own career. I think we both feel that through doing it, it's made our careers brilliant and the squiggliness means that we've thrived rather than just been in kind of survival mode, sometimes slightly more in survival mode. Uh, but you know, more time in thriving than surviving, I think has got to be most of our aim. And so over time it's grown. Uh, we've now got over 155 star reviews on Apple, which is thanks to lots of people in this room and people listening who we asked to do that and actually people go on and do it, which we're so <laughs> grateful for. Genuinely, the best moments of our week are reading those small reviews from people to hear the impact that we're making. That's why we do what we do. And that's why we run Amazing If, which is to make work better for everyone. And that's every single person in every organisation, wherever people are. So that's why it's so brilliant to be here. It's a really nice change of scenery from not being in our pyjamas, to be honest. Um, not worrying that the toddlers are going to wake up halfway through recording, which I would say happens at least 25% of the time. And we're like, quick, quick break while the toddler screams. George, who's at the back today, has to then edit it to take out the screaming of said toddlers. And between us, we've kind of got three. So you're like, the chances of it happening are quite high. So it's really good to be here. But really what we wanted to do was say thank you. Thank you to everybody listening, everybody here tonight. And we thought the best way to do that was to get four incredible people uh, for you to all listen and learn from and for us to do the same thing. People who we felt had one thing in common. They were all doing kind of their version or their bit to make work better in some way, shape or form. They're all really interesting and challenging and inspiring. We know they're going to be really fascinating to listen to. So that's going to be the structure for this evening. We're going to have lots of conversations together. Helen will do some, I'll do some. And at the end, we're going to get everyone back on stage and do a bit of a, a Q&A and then let everybody go home as it's a Monday night. So we're, we are grateful that you're all here on a Monday straight after work, which I appreciate makes your day even longer. Brilliant. Let's get started. So our first guest is Simon, Simon Vilcliffe. So we'll get on stage uh, and start talking about Simon's world. Hello. Thank you. Um, I was on a learning programme with the Marketing Academy and Simon was talking about his business and his approach and uh, not the normal, you'll hear more about that in a second, really, really stuck with me and we connected, I think it was on Twitter afterwards yeah. and we've kind of been in and out of connection ever since. I remember I had a very uh, memorable mentor session, which you also might not remember with you over Skype. I remember being in, I was obviously broadcast somewhere in your office because I think your lovely PA was saying hello to me as well on the screen. <laughs> well, also, yeah. uh, and you were just really challenging me in front of everybody on Skype with a brilliant mentor. But that's the sort of great challenging approach that you have. It can be that case. Um, and Simon identifies as a C of a brilliant organisation called Webbar, which is actually based relatively close to where I live. Absolutely. Uh, and identifies as a Marxist capitalist. I think it's really I don't hear many people in business identifying as that and believes that there's a different model for how we should be running businesses and that then influences how we work in organisations. And so I really wanted to bring Simon into the conversation to understand what we can learn from Marxist capitalism, um, hear how it's applied at Webmart yep. uh, and maybe also take some actions back into our own organisations and our own careers to see what we can do with that. So, what is Marxist capitalism? Well, in a, in a kind of elevator pitchy kind of way, because we're in this year London and people have got short attention spans and nobody <laughs> reads that. I mean, fundamentally it is capitalism, but it's working it 
for the people, for everyone within the organisation, rather than those at the top mm -hmm. that have everything. So effectively, if you're all working, one would imagine, for profit organisations and you have KPIs and all that, we have that as well. But what we do is we have three uh, ways that we try and deliver value to ourselves, our clients and our suppliers. Those are the three kind of areas. One is, and the first is, we try and maximise the intellectual return that we give to everybody. Because if you understand the person, and if you understand what makes them tick, you can then wrap the job around them to make the, give them the greatest opportunity to be successful. You then measure and maximise the emotional return. So if you let people do more of what they're good at as quickly as possible, and keep refining it over time, because we all change, and then you give them a role that allows them to be successful, they enjoy it. And if you've got people who are in, have a competitive advantage and are enjoying it, people want to work with you and people want to work alongside you and people want to be part of your ecosystem and that gives you the financial return. So we maximise all of those three things and then we make sure that we every six months everybody anonymously ranks everybody else to make sure we're aligned to that. The only person that's public is mine, so I have that accountability that everybody can anonymously rank me so it keeps me on the straight and narrow and keeps me honest. And then the, the profit we make, we keep a level for retention within the business because obviously you've got to retain profits to invest in the, the future of the organisation. And then we share out the rest amongst the team. So we mark to market. So everybody's paid the amount for their job. So they're continuing professional development. They go up, they get more base salary. And then the, percent, the, the surplus profits uh, then get shared out amongst the team. And it varies. You know, in good times, we've had the maximum we had was 80% of base salary as a bonus, the minimum is none. So it's, you're absolutely aligned to the organisation. As a consequence of that, you get people with the right kind of ethical value. Mm -hmm. And you actually are allowed to remove, in a democratic way, in a meritocratic way, the people that aren't. And that allows us to keep that kind of ethos of the business. So we've been going 23 years. We never uh, have borrowed any money. And we have never not made a profit. And that's in a marketplace. We, we manage printing on behalf of everybody. So you imagine 96, there wasn't even that there internet here, which sounds <laughs> bizarre uh, now. So the thing, the thing has evolved beyond all recognition. We develop our own software for trading globally. We do you know, brand management and all that kind of stuff now for Microsoft or Xbox or Nintendo or whatever. Whole range of different clients now where you're, you've broadened out, so we've evolved our value proposition, mm. uh, as you'd imagine. And, uh, and this has allowed us to keep the core values of the business, but broaden our, our, our business to a wider sphere. So can I dig into the everybody in the company reviews everybody else in the company? So how, how often does that happen? Well, to start with, our onboarding process for people is we typically do a 10 minute chat with them on Skype, which is Darwinian, because if you're not cool and re relaxed with tech, you're not gonna do that, so they, they don't get through that. <laughs> Uh, and then once they get through that, we'll do a psychometric yeah. uh, a test so you understand the internals of the person, the drivers, the kind of type of person that they are. And then you'll get the team that will be most befitting of that type of person to do a team interview. And then if they get through that, then I interview everyone. OK. Uh, if they get through that, they get offered a job. And then after three months, everybody reviews them. Wow, when you everybody, everybody in the business. Wow, and how many people is that now? Uh, Forty-two. So forty people review them on yeah. an online tool. Uh, online tool that we, we developed ourselves because there aren't things like that yeah. out there. So we're about twenty-five million, forty people, and then they get through the first three months, and there's three things that we rank them on. One is their capability, their ability to do the job. The other is their attitude, and their, the third thing is their long-term potential to be a great web martyr. And then we have things that are great about them. So you list them anonymously and areas for development. So that's after three months and then they've got another at six months. OK, so every six months that's happening for well, everybody. Well, every, every three months on their probationary, yeah. get to six months, then after everybody reviews everybody every six months. Do people look forward to that? Depends. <laughs> it depends. It's quite interesting, actually, looking over time. Um, you know, sometimes yes and sometimes really not. Yeah. Um, if you look at it as a, as a business leader, the time that people hate most in their time at work is when they're being reviewed by their boss. Mm -hmm. Bar none. Nobody enjoys it. And the boss hates it even more. You know, it's terrible. It's awful. As a line manager, because it's me against you, 
I think you're great, bad. Why? It's a one-to-one, -one. so if you think you're great, so generally people say all nice things, because actually if you say anything that's challenging, you say, why do you think that? Like, and it gets very personal. Yeah. Whereas if you've got 30 people saying that, then it's very different. You say, why do you think 30 people think you're not as good as you think in this, or more likely are better than this? So the manager becomes the facilitator of the conversation absolutely. rather than the determiner so, of so it. So effectively, you're kind of representing, and the, the aggregate of subjective is objective. Mm -hmm. You know, if everybody thinks that, that's that. It doesn't matter whatever you think yourself, because we do a self-assessment as well. And we ask them four questions. One is how well you feel Webmark maximises your intellectual, emotional and financial return. And the fourth question is how well do you manage your work-life balance? So those are the four things that we measure on an yeah. ongoing basis. Then we know we've got best fit, either within the organisation or within the role. And I remember when I heard you speak a while ago as well, you talked about like you invest in helping people to be their best at work in, in ways like tech, for example. Like if people want a desk that goes up and down um, or whatever absolutely. computer they want, that they, yep, you will anything. invest in that for them to help them to be their best at work. Absolutely, as much as you want. Uh, inside and outside of work, you mm -hmm. know, you want to make, you want to make their, their life as enjoyable as possible. So we pay for people's ironing to be done. We've got uh, the oxygen farm. I mean, doesn't Webmark sound really cool? <laughs> but, you know, uh, you want to take stress out, uh, out of people's life. You're as flexible as you possibly can be. We give people their birthday off work, but we also give up to two uh, significant others time off work. So it may be a parent if you've, you, know, you haven't got kids, or it may be your kids if you've got kids, to take that day off work as well. Every touch point you can with a person we try and maximise the value to everybody. Yeah. You know, so like we had somebody start today so that it's not a kind of, who the hell's this walking around? We do a one minute video, first take of that person. <laughs> so you've got one minute video, first take, so you can share before they join who, who they are, what they're about. Yeah. And we have some fantastic ones, some dreadful ones as well, admittedly. <laughs> but, but you kind of tell then how people, you know, you're outside your comfort zone yeah. straight away. And you have to do that. You have your picture taken, you see on the, the board, everybody, you know, welcomes you and all this kind of stuff. So it's a different kind of environment, but it feels different. It is different. It acts different. The physical workspace that we're in is, is very different. Tell us about the big yellow shed of well, Wonderment. Well, we've, uh, we've got the yellow shed of Wonderment, um, which is um, it, it's an industrial unit on an industrial estate in Bista, one in Barnsley as well. Um, and, but every room is themed. And not just to be wacky, not, not in a kind of contrived way, because each one is psychologically profiled to deliver a different outcome. And we ask people, when you go into the web, web mart and have a wander around, everybody has a tour. We have about 1,200 people a year come uh, around the shed. Every, we then just say, where do you want to go for the meeting? And immediately know the kind of meeting you're going to have from the person that's coming in there after they've seen it. And we just put a, like a sign up. Um, said that instead of most people have a boardroom, we have a not boardroom. <laughs> and we put, a, we put a sign up and that had 17,000 hits just for putting a sign up saying this is our not boardroom now. Because a lot of people try go in there and have a look at it and have a feel of it. And anybody who wants to come around and have a look at the Yellow Shed of Wonderment, feel free. Not uh, a squiggly careers tour. Uh, well, obviously, it's, a bit like, it's a bit like kind of this. We've got a room downstairs which is our uh, 1930s cinema room where we have kind of meetings and all that kind of stuff. But it's a good training room and all that, all of those kind of things. So you try and make everything remarkable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in a literal sense, is it remarkable? If it's remarkable and it adds value, intellectual, emotional and financial value, we'll do it. So thank you very much for sharing it. I hope people have got some insight. Thank you so, so much. My pleasure. Really, really appreciate thank it. Thank you. So we're going to talk a little bit about entrepreneurship now and what it means to be an entrepreneur. And I'm always interested to know uh, with our listeners, people we've got in the room, just a quick show of hands. How many people here at some point would like to run their own business? Just a show of hands. OK, so that's 70 percent. So we can probably assume that maybe our listener base is something similar. How many of you here either do or would like to work for a startup? OK, that's about 20 percent. And that's really interesting because I ask that question quite a lot at different leadership conferences, different events a bit like this that I do. And I would say there's a really big discrepancy between the amount of people who want to do their own thing and the amount of people who want to work in organisations who have got founders. And yeah, we've got three founders on the stage. Tonight. I've worked for founders now. And I think that relationship between working for a founder and being a founder is a really interesting one. 
So before we get into that with Piffin Dan, what I'd like to do is just introduce your business, but through the lens of why it exists rather than what you do. I think we all know the kind of start with the why and how compelling it is. So Pip, what's, what's your why at the dots? So just to describe what the dots is, so Forbes called us the next LinkedIn and that's absolutely my kind of motivation and vision, I guess. Um, I started it because I was working in the creative industries and I was just surrounded by people that were working in a very different squiggly type way. So uh, lots of my friends were increasingly freelancing, uh, adopting portfolio careers, loads of my mates had side hustles. We were all trying to get ideas off the ground. And you know, LinkedIn is great if you have that traditional linear CV based career, but what we were trying to do was actually make ideas happen. And I wanted a space where I could actually connect with people I was trying to work with, collaborate with in a way that made sense to us. So I guess the core difference between how the dots works and LinkedIn works is people post projects, but then credit the full team that executed on the project. So someone, a project can be someone coming up with an idea for a podcast and the full team you've got around you making this happen, yeah. or it could be an uh, independent magazine, or it can be an app and it could be like the UI designer, UX designer, front end engineer. And with that, we then help connect people to finding people to collaborate with and to help ideas happen. And I think from my personal journey, like I'm a non-tech, tech founder who decided to go up against LinkedIn. Um, uh, so when I was starting this journey, I didn't know how to connect with web developers, web designers. I didn't even know what I needed to know. And so, you know, in many ways, the platform is designed around that need of, you know, people want to make ideas happen and connect to people that are outside of their ecosystem. So yeah, I, I you know, Classic started it um, from my houseboat in, in King's Cross. And so, yeah, we're now at half a million members and over around 10,000 brands using us to find talent, which is kind of mental to see Including it us. So Including very recently, us. Um, we uh, posted our first job on the dots as Amazing If uh, to get some help with some of our social media and marketing. And actually, Ria, who's here on the front, oh, on the front came, <laughs> which Pip, Pip didn't know that, but we, um, <laughs> and actually we posted it in lots of places. So we weren't, we didn't just go for the dots. We were like, right, let's try out different places. And interestingly, our best quality candidates and the people who were the strongest fit with us actually came through the dots. So it was a really fascinating kind of process to go through because it wasn't that we'd gone, we put all our eggs in one basket. We were like, oh, let's try. But we've got quite corporate backgrounds. So actually we were thinking we sort of, we don't necessarily want necessarily the people who live the corporate world because they probably don't want to work with us, to be honest. So it was it. It was a really good, it kind of worked for us, certainly. Oh God, you know I'm not I know, I know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. God, I'm just a hugger, I just want to hug her right now. <laughs> yeah, you really are. So, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Dan is it day two of his new business, so I am particularly grateful that on day two you have chosen to spend the evening with us. I don't think you knew it was day two when you said yes, but I don't. I think we know each other too well that you yeah. could have kind I'm of not dropped the out. Best planner, <laughs> so I definitely wouldn't have known. No. Yeah. So tell us about Heights day two. Uh, sure. Um, so uh, we're building a brand uh, to make people think. So I'm really interested in uh, the way people prioritize various organs in their body. And my perspective with my business partner we had was actually um, people don't really prioritize their brain. They don't put their brain first. They don't really understand or think often about the relationship they have with their brain, despite it arguably being the most important organ in your body. So being on a journey uh, myself with um, like mental health and insomnia, which I ended up surprising myself with by curing it through nutrition and supplementation after trying all the things to do with the mind. Um, so my relationship with my brain was it's my mind. Um, therefore, I will cure it with um, all the things. You know, I will improve my physical fitness. I'll sleep. Well, sleeping more was impossible with insomnia, but that was my attempt. I will, um, you know, I'll meditate every day, all the things. And actually, in the end, the only thing that really shifted for me was um, someone bought me a book called Optimum Nutrition for the Mind and was like, try this. And I was like, it's weird. I've never thought about eating for my brain. I just think about eating for how I look or how I want to be. And um, Within two weeks, I was sleeping till 5 a.m., which was very big for me. And within four weeks till 7 a.m., and I shifted up my diet. I started to learn about supplementation, and then I started to sort of really think about um, how interesting it is that a lot of the information that's out there seems to be this guru says X, and that guru says Y, and they seem to be quite diametrically opposed. But the science is always relatively consistent. The problem is with science is just 
effing boring quite often. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, I don't know what I'm going to do, but I definitely know it's going to be in the brain health and performance space. And the thing that I'm not a neuroscientist, neither is my business partner, but I'm a good communicator. So I was like, I'll read the science journals because I find them interesting. I'll turn them into a newsletter on brain health and performance. And I basically will, you know, turn science into plain English. So I started writing a newsletter 43 weeks ago, because that's how my mind works now. I'm like, <laughs> week 43? Don't even know what date it is. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's week 43. And in the background, started building um, our brand, which is Heights. Um, and so the idea is to create nutritional supplements, digital content, and digital experiences that work together to help people reach their heights and fulfill their potential. All scientifically proven. I've spent a lot of my time bringing on board and convincing skeptical scientists on board to our mission. And um, the thing that I found really interesting in the whole journey is um, we actually get open-minded scientists. They're open-minded to prove to us that they won't change their mind. So <laughs> like, I'm, I'm a famous neuroscientist. You can't convince me that a supplement is going to do anything. But I'll come in and I will tell you why there's no way. And what's interesting is because our entire perspective is we're not saying it's a cure-all. We're saying if more people understood how their brain works and actually had your expertise and your opinion here and were framing it correctly at the right time in someone's journey, then they might take better steps and be make better decisions on X, Y, or Z. And you have all these sorts of different ways of explaining the 360 approach to how a brain works. And every single time they sort of leave being like, <clears throat> I'm kind of annoyed, but fair play. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think I've ever felt under so much pressure as when we had breakfast recently and I was thinking, I don't know what I'm meant to choose. Yeah, uh, yeah you did say that. I was, I was, like, I was always like waiting for Dan, and I was like, do I, do I have this shot? Do I, do I eat this thing? Yeah. Um, and apparently, there's no silver bullet either, which is very annoying. I was like, oh, is there like one? Th have you come up with one thing? And he was like, oh no, you know, it's sort of not quite. Well, as easy quite as nice. That. Is, you know, people always like, you know, what should I eat? Because around me, and I'm like, well, I'm not a nutritionist, so don't worry about it. But yeah. you know, it can make some good recommendations for you. But um, and the other thing is, people are like, right, so if I take your pill, will I get smarter? I was like, are you going to watch Love Island or listen to Mozart? Yeah. Because, like, you know, I, I, again, well, again, like in this space, you know, there's, there's a lot of gurus, there's a lot of people peddling a lot of different things. And it's very similar to where the, the protein market was like 10 years ago. You know, who honestly believes that you sit at home and drink protein shakes and get the body you want? You drink a protein shake because it's a trigger for a lifestyle you're choosing and then you put in all the work and if you don't put in the work you're just drinking protein shake at home. That's all that's happening and you should be eating better food. That's really what should be happening. So the brain is exactly the same. It's an organ like you can only put in the best inputs for your brain. But if you sit around and take a supplement to get smart and then spend the whole day staring at, you know, SpongeBob SquarePants. You'll laugh, you won't get that much smarter, no. I'll be honest. <laughs> Though I do like Squidward. Um, <laughs> so on, you've met, Dan, through your podcast, Secret Leaders, you've met lots of different entrepreneurs. We're all quite different entrepreneurs with different journeys. And um, I was actually talking to somebody the other day about a BBC podcast called The Disruptors. Yeah. And everybody who's interviewed on The Disruptors, I think really lives up to this stereotype of an entrepreneur. That's all they do. They work all of the time. They've invested everything they've got in it. You know, the house is on the line. It seems really intense and there's no space for anything else. And they've often been really successful, uh, depending on how you define success. But certainly their businesses, you know, you've heard of or you would assume to have been successful. And so I'm interested to know, you know, through starting multiple businesses, Dan, you actually write about it very transparently. And Pip, you spend a lot of time with people, you know, raising investment kind of in that space, people who are disruptors. Do you think these entrepreneurs have lots in common? Do you think... There's almost like some sort of DNA thread somewhere that you're, like, you're born to be an entrepreneur. We were having this chat earlier, actually. It was funny because, um, yeah, obviously Dan's a serial entrepreneur. I literally just saw a real-world world, real, real world problem that I yeah. wanted to solve. And I think what is interesting, though, I am dyslexic. and Which you actually, call your superpower. Which I call my superpower. And actually, weirdly, anyone who's ever emailed me, they know that I put delightfully dyslexic excuse typos at the end of my email. Um, quick question, anyone in the audience dyslexic? Okay, so fun fact, 35% of entrepreneurs are actually dyslexic and 40% of self-made millionaires. So congratulations, it's a superpower. <laughs> um, and I think the interesting thing with that is like, I, I don't, I think anyone can be an entrepreneur, but I'm lucky that I have dyslexia because it leads to kind of more entrepreneurs. So I think in one way I was sort of was born in it because I had what most people would class as a disability, but has weirdly yeah. meant that I am, I guess, born to be an entrepreneur. But the, the interesting thing is the traits that dyslexia um, elevates. So we tend to be more creative. Mm -hmm. 
um, we tend to have higher levels of perseverance, which is kind of that deep yeah, trait that on because yeah. things are tough. We grow up struggling with reading and writing and articulating, and we have to persevere when we're young. So I think we get that well of yeah. that grittiness, which all entrepreneurs need and I think the other thing is we're, we're very empathetic um, and they're not sure why but they think it's because maybe we struggled when we were younger we empathize with other people mm -hmm. which tends to make us better leaders yeah. so weirdly yes I'm lucky that I had dyslexia but also I think anyone can be an entrepreneur if you have those core traits yeah. which is being a great leader building a world-class team persevering through the tough bits and having that creative kind of sense of purpose behind it. So, yeah, I, yeah. I think that's what... Dan, you've met some really interesting people and lots of those quite famous entrepreneurs. Yeah. Do they have lots in common, do you think, or are they all really all the behind-the-scenes chat that you have with them? Um, yeah, I think the thing that um, all the entrepreneurs have in common, which is my favourite trait in general, is grit and resilience. That's easily the thread because they're quite different personalities in general. You know, you've got like, it, they're just all the different kinds of backgrounds and that always seems to be really consistent. Sometimes, you know, the grit is, um, you know, can be perceived as stubbornness as well. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's also like not calling it quits when you should have. And that's super hard. Like, I've definitely called it quits when we should have. Yeah. And that's really difficult because I'll never not know if it was the right call or not. But to me, it was the right call at the right time. Equally, I've been in a situation where I've just doubled down on the grit and said, no, I'm not moving. And that was also the right call, the right time. So, you know, it's a bit of a, a, a like a moving pattern. But I think what you said is so true is like actually I was explaining I was with some people over the weekend and um, they'd gone to Oxbridge and um, someone mentioned because I've had a talk where I talked about this once, like I, I got into Cambridge and then I turned down going. And the reason I did that was because I wasn't actually very academic and I worked unbelievably hard, mm -hmm. harder than everyone else, I was convinced, to get in. And then when I got there, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to literally be the stupidest person in the whole university for like three years, which might be a great thing for grit and everything else. But at the same time, I was like, I'm not sure I'm into the label <laughs> enough to have that life and, you know, chose Nottingham, which I had a great time and still really enjoyed university with. But I think the interesting thing is the people who naturally get into places like Cambridge, you know, naturally seem to do amazingly in all the jobs and everything else, they don't get the opportunity to learn about grit and resilience the same way as people who really struggle. Stress and resilience and grit, they're like muscles. So the first time you have something really shocking happen to you, it's the worst day of your life. And the next day, the same thing happened to you. You're like, I feel like I might have stubbed my toe. Um, <laughs> so it's the same thing, right? It's like, and then the more experiences you have like that, the more you're like, my God, I can take a lot. Like it's just water off a duck, the duck's back <laughs> yeah. after a while. And that's a really good thing. And if you're naturally gifted, and there's an amazing book called Grit by yes. Angela Duckworth, yeah, yeah. and it's one of my favorite books. And, yeah. you know, she literally talks about, I mean, it's kids that um, find everything unbelievably easy do not get the opportunity to learn how hard it is and how to overcome challenge. And ultimately that's what really leads to growth. Yeah. And so just talking about that the kind of grittiness, often it's described that when you run your own business, the vibe is very roller coaster kind of esque. The highs are higher, the lows are lower. Um, and I think that's probably because you are so personally invested in it, or certainly that's how I feel with Amazing If is, you know, it's yours. So when something goes wrong, you sort of go, oh, it's sort of me and that's, I've got to fix this and maybe I've made the wrong choice here. And actually the successes are amazing because you've, you know, the blood, sweat and tears have come from you. Mm. Albeit I loved corporate life as well. So I'm definitely not an entrepreneur. I'm not even sure I'd use that term for myself where I loved working in big companies just as much. But I'm interested to know how kind of aware you are of thinking about your successes and then what you kind of do to cope with the kind of lows. So let's start with the successes first. The, the grit bit's always more interesting, but I think it's important <laughs> that we balance it out with the successes. So kind of in the last six months in 2019, what's kind of been a real high point for you so far? Yeah, Pip? it's so funny what you say. Like, my, yeah, my life is a crazy roller coaster. Um, for me, it's literally any time someone kind of builds their network or gets an opportunity on the dots. So like we have a, like a good news Slack channel where we share lovely things that are happening. So anyone on the team from anywhere and I've got a number of team work remotely, like it can be a lovely message from a client or someone's just got a job. I mean, on Friday, there was this huge package that arrived at the dots and, and one of my team opened it like it was like a pass the parcel. And it was this beautiful print and it was from this 
studio who they've been on the dots and they'd, they'd ended up picking up so many new clients. So they were a new agency and they picked up so many new clients, they'd had to hire a team as well. And they were just oh. saying, thank you that I built my business, but also thank you for helping me connect with people to hire. And so it's those sort of magic moments that make the hard bits really worth it. And I think for me also, because a lot of what we do is around helping companies connect with diverse talent. So mm. of our nearly half a million members, 68 percent are female. I do love men, by the way. I absolutely love men. But LinkedIn skews the other way, so I'm kind of glad to readdress the balance. Um, and 31 percent of our community is BAME, 16 percent LGBT. And we do a lot of work around helping companies connect with neurodiverse talent and talent from uh, non-privileged backgrounds. So I guess for me, it's those moments as well. So you know, recently someone um, sent me a picture of their mum and it's because she always wears the dots bags because we wow. helped her <laughs> kids get into an industry they never had access to. And those moments like when you're having a really, really bad, hard day, if I look through the Good News Channel, it just it, it just brings my least. motivation back, which is amazing. We often tell people to have... Um, regardless of where you're working, like a good news file mm. or like a good day file. And so I think it's often actually in those tough days where you do have to remind yourself of the good things. I'm not particularly nostalgic, but the one thing I have kept over the years is when people write you notes, yeah. handwritten notes. Mm. It's, the one, it's the one thing I do keep. And I very rarely look at them, but it's funny if I think about when I do, it's often when you really need it. Yeah. It's when things are going okay, you don't need it quite so much. So Dan, how about you, a success this year, other than being on day two of your new business? Well getting our chief science officer on board. Super important moment for us because very clearly, state to everyone, not a nutritionist, not a neuroscientist. You know, it's really important yeah. to me that we have expert, credible people. And um, credibility, in my opinion, sort of comes from the top and then flows down. So I went really over the top ambitious with who I was trying to target. And um, I found this unbelievable lady on Twitter after reading her book. So Twitter is amazing for this, but she writes a book called The Source, mm, yeah. um, which is phenomenal. And she um, has a PhD in neuropharmacology, is a senior lecturer at MIT, Oxford, King's, and is like a business advisor and has been for the last 15 years. I was years reading her profile and thinking, I don't... It's crazy, how, right? How can you do all those things? Well, I met her and I was like, I just literally also don't know how old you are. She's like, also annoying. Like, you read that and you're like, you must be 70. And you meet her and you're like... <laughs> What? Yeah. Um, yeah, I basically I managed to get her um, an initial meeting through Twitter after reading her book, saying how great it was and just saying, like, read one week of our newsletter. And if you think it's good, then when you're in London next, let's meet. And from that, you know, it sort of cascaded down. Now she's our chief science officer. And when I approach other people to be on our science and wellness advisory board, which I named myself because I thought it'd be hilarious to call a swab. <laughs> um, um, which they all really like as well, uh, as the little things. Yeah. Um, when you they do see talk her, about laughter, you do talk about how important laughter is, don't there you? There you go. So, yeah, so when, uh, when they see her, you know, it's, it, it sort of takes away so much more of the sales pitch. They're like, well, you know, she did her research, which she did, and, you know, she's able to speak. So, um, there's a very long winded way of saying, I was going to say that, which I now have. <laughs> <laughs> but you mentioned handwritten notes, 43 weeks of newsletter always get really interesting feedback and very helpful feedback on email, but um, eight handwritten letters into the office with very specific ways in which um, what we shared that week has helped their family or them. Oh, that's lovely. Um, and it's super meaningful. So let's talk about the tough stuff, because <laughs> I know for both of you there have been tough moments. So Pip, a moment in the last year or so where you've sort of thought, I want to go to bed for the rest of the day. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's time for a duvet day. Yeah, um, I, raising investment is the most mm. horrific thing I've ever been through, I guess. So um, I uh, closed a four million round, which is obviously great, but at well, the you same said that time. Quickly, but just sorry. Four, <laughs> four million um, pound round. But yeah, I mean, it was super tough because, I mean, just to put it into context here in, in the UK, only about 9% of angel funding goes to female founders. And at my level, it's only 2.3%. Yeah. So don't get me wrong, like raising investment for any founder is an absolute nightmare, male or female, but it can be particularly tough for women. And I think that was a really grueling experience where I had to kind of really dig deep. Yeah. Um, I don't think investment is for everyone. You know, I always say like raising investment is a bit like going into a marriage without the benefit of a makeup sex. Um, <laughs> you, should really, um, you should really check you really need the money and there are other ways to do it. But you know, I am on a mission to take on LinkedIn. So I, I have to be mm. realistic that I'm going to be raising money every two years for the rest of my life. That was where I've been at my 
darkest, I think. It's, um, it, this is actually my second round. Um, my first round, I did it all wrong. My second round, I actually decided I was going to get pitch ready for investment. So I got in touch with all my female founders and said, who are the worst investors that you've heard about in town? I made a point to pitch them for the first like month. Okay. And the reason so I you did went that tough straight away. I went tough straight away because I was like, I want to get pitch ready. I want to have the worst experiences and I want to get asked the worst questions. And okay. so it was in hindsight it was the best thing because I was so pitch ready by the time I was meeting the investors I really wanted. Because yeah. the round that I did before, I was meeting all these investors I loved like first and I was way too excited and did you're you my the, dream. Did you hug them all? And I just wasn't ready for their questions. So this one I did it this way but like at the same time that month was horrific I was literally coming home and crying on my husband's shoulder and and I was pitch ready by the end of it but it was uh, yeah it was a really really tough experience so that was probably the hardest thing going on in this year and and like you know it's funny Dan hasn't even spoken about it but one of my highlights this year is actually something that Dan also founded which is something called founders which is a group of founders that get together share horror stories and I don't know if I've told you this Dan but we all went away for a weekend it's about 60 of us mm. and I was a bit skeptical because Dan had been emailing me going will you join this thing called founders and I get invited to all these founder things anyway I went away for the weekend <laughs> and it was amazing because we're all talking about all these things we've been through and it was basically like founders therapy yeah. so I wanted to yeah, thank like, Dan because <laughs> I'm not sure I <laughs> thank well, Dan yeah. but it was quite nice to know other founders have been through the yeah. same hell but Dan have your tough moments over the last 12 months because you've not had you not had an easy 12 months. No, so the reality is just over a year ago, say 14 months ago or so, um, I'd raised money and uh, we were having, it was a tech business, we were having loads of problems, some unforeseen, some predictable, whatever, and I was just deeply unhappy and just hating everything and I had insomnia and like all this stuff. And I basically just had a really honest conversation with my business partner being like, this is just not what I want to be doing with my life. I don't want to come to the office. and. We had all the things. So we had money, amazing office in Shoreditch, like really talented people, Living like the all dream. the things that you, I thought, you know, were the things that I was aiming for. And then when I had them, I was like, I literally hate this. And it's a really weird thing to be in a um, cage of your own making, yeah. which is the major benefit, I would say, because I, like, I, I've been an employee and I remember having that feeling, but being like, well, it's my choice to leave. And even then, it took me ages to leave because I had the whole fear and the financial insecurity and what will I do and where will I live and I've got bills and all that stuff. So I get it. And so it's even more mental when it's your own business and you're like, I've created my own cage. How ridiculous. I had a really, really brutally honest conversation with my business partner. Um, the conversation went on for about a week, but we have a very open relationship and I wear my heart on my sleeve in case anyone has not noticed that by now. He's much more considered than I am. At the end of it, I was like, you know, I, I like, we just need to go back to the investors and explain the situation. And, and ultimately, we went back and had a very tough conversation with very professional investors explaining that essentially we'd give the money back and divvy it out percentage wise what everyone had. But I couldn't work another day in this business. And I was really sorry. And to our amazement, they backed us and we're like, you know, let go of everyone, get out of the leases, shut down the business, keep the money, take three months and think about what you want to do. And that was, you know, about 60 weeks ago. Um, you know, within two to three months, started writing the newsletter and here we are a year later. And it's a really refreshing and interesting perspective on you don't have to do the thing that you've gotten yourself into. It was all of my own making and also within my realm of possibility to be my undoing as well. So that was definitely a low, which became a high and hence heights. <laughs> um, and actually, if you do want to read about it, Dan, um, on his LinkedIn profile, not his dots profile, perhaps you should talk about that, um, <laughs> has uh, written really transparently about the journey of actually shutting down that business um, in a very kind of open and refreshing way. And actually, there is a really compelling read. Mm. And you did a few articles, didn't you? So are they still, can people still yeah. read those? Yeah, yeah. So um, just to finish off, um, I thought in our book, we've asked 100 people who we've met people who we found really interesting and inspiring to give us their kind of best piece of career advice for the squiggly career. So I'm going to read out Pip and Dan because they both uh, contributed. So I thought to save them their embarrassment, I'll do it for them. Yeah, I thought that's what you were about to ask. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. I feel that'd be quite a formal. Brain boy, remember like, we, this? Do, like, <laughs> we do a little reading. Uh, but uh, let's see. And actually, we've actually got heights in here. Right? So, we, you know, we were ahead I of the game. The foresight. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so you do some planning. So uh, Dan's best piece of career advice is pick a company that will challenge you intellectually instead of one that will pay you well. 
I actively chose worse paying companies for more interesting and challenging roles and that's exactly what led to the rocket ship of personal development. Very wise. <laughs> and then Pip, I think trusting your gut is often underestimated, particularly in technology, but you're actually our most sophisticated machines that exist. We take in billions of inputs a day and synthesise it into gut feelings. How incredible is that? I guess it's why Steve Jobs famously said intuition is more powerful than intellect, which I'm very grateful for. Mm -hmm. uh, and on that note, we're just going to like to thank Dan and Pip and we'll move on to our final interview. So everybody, this is John Vincent and I'm so delighted that John is actually final speaker. John is the CEO, co-founder as well of Leon and has written a brilliant book which is out in November called Winning Not Fighting. Thank you for um, saying that. Uh, the reason I'm particularly glad, I'm really glad to hear your experience, but the reason I'm really glad that you've, um, we've got you as our last speaker before we did the panel is because hearing from Pip and Dan, like there were some tough experiences in there and I think what you talk about in the book I find very calming. I find it as when I think about a lot of the challenges that are going on in the work and a lot of the things that Pip and Dan talk about when raising investment and difficulties and failure and resilience, I actually find the book a very calming response to some of that. So I'd love to get into that so people can, if anyone's feeling some of that stress in whatever they're doing, entrepreneur or corporate careerist, they can maybe take some things away. So. The book is all about Wing Chun, and I think I should probably ask you the same question that I asked Simon in explaining Marxist capitalism. Can you give us the high-level overview of what Wing Chun is? Um, does anyone do Wing Chun here? It's a form of Kung Fu, and most famously, uh, it was the Kung Fu practiced by Bruce Lee and his uh, mentor and teacher, Ip Man. It's actually probably the most ancient martial art comes from the Shaolin Temple in uh, China, um, whereas karate sort of started around 1900, Krav Maga started about 1947 in Israel. This is really the fundamental sort of initial mixed martial arts kind of uh, martial art. And weirdly, it's about not fighting, mm. which is strange for a martial art. Uh, and interestingly, it was developed by women. And so it had a rather interesting birthplace, also influenced by Taoism and Zen Buddhism. And fundamentally, it's about not having to fight because it's really uh, can hurt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it's about not having to fight. Um, so if we pick up that fighting bit, one of the things that first struck me in the book was about this sort of fighting language that has become quite pervasive at work. And actually, I was listening, and sorry to pick this out, Dan, but I heard you saying, like, target people earlier. And that was one of the words that you talk about in the book, that we have, like, target and beating. And I was talking to Sarah earlier today, and I was like, oh, we've got to combat that problem. And I was like, oh, I'm saying these words. And this warlike language has mm. become chief for the mm. kind of CEO, and it's mm. become just part of work. And I. I thought it'd be really interesting to hear from you about what your perspective of, of that sort of fighting mm. language that's become part of work and what's the challenges that might create for us. I think, Dan, you're not alone, right? It's very tempting to use warlike language. Um, but, I mean, I had a session even before I did Wing Chun with a woman called Amy, and we had sort of session zero, and um, she then recorded it. And the first session, she sat me down and said, Look, I've recorded it, I've listened to it over and over. My one observation, and it might work for you, um, is that you kind of think you're the general of an army. And I was like, well, I am, aren't I, right? I've got scarce resources, I've got to beat the competitors, I've got to smash my targets, we've got to create a war room, right? Um, and, and I thought, wow, God, she's right. I'm not, I'm not actually the general of an army. Um, and I think, you know, for all of us that have studied, um, for all of us that have studied any sort of basic psychology, you know, the idea of, the map that we create of the world, the constructs we create, the stories we tell ourselves, the stories we tell ourselves about the very, very chaotic world that exists. We, we tend to want to create a map of it, right? Um, what was interesting in going back and looking at the history of the war metaphor mm. in business is, does anyone know where the word strategy comes from? It's sort of from the Greek, the general, or of the general, pertaining to the general. And if you were doing business in the 1950s, if you said, what's our strategy? People would say, what's our what? Because interestingly, it wasn't until the mid-1960s that war became the predominant way 
of us thinking about the activity. Before then, people thought, I've got a customer, uh, and my job is to organise these lovely people to do the right thing by the customer. And then the US got particularly excited by the idea of strategy as the general. Uh, and then, does anyone know who came along after that? Which book was adopted? The Art of War <laughs> uh, by Sun Tzu. And it's the one that's in sort of uh, Wall Street. And it's the one, I think even there's a Soprano episode where you know, his shrink tells him to read it. And everyone in Wall Street and business, and certainly the city and Wall Street, they use the art of war as this kind of great guide um, without realising that Sun Tzu didn't write it about business. He just wrote it about war. And actually, <laughs> it's not a bad book when it comes to war. But the, what they don't realise, even Sun Tzu said, try not to fight. Fighting is bad for the state, it depletes the resources, it screws the planet up, it screws the people up, soldiers don't like it, they come back and they don't like all that. After World War One, it wasn't a great thing. People didn't sort of like love World War One, And so you start to think, ooh, that's perhaps why people are unwell at work. Maybe we're creating something that screws the planet up, misses out the customer, and then gets confused by targeting the customer. Because it's like, there is no customer in war oh, we better target the customer, I guess. And then it gets all confused. And then, and then you start having war rooms and you s smash your targets. And I was in, I was in a, a supermarket in America. This guy had won an award for customer service. And it said, to Sam for dominating in customer service. <laughs> and I was like, wow, even the ego <laughs> is involved in dominating in customer service. So, you know, that's, that's sort of how I started to realise oops, maybe it's screwing us up, and maybe it's leading to this inflammatory mindset, triggering our fight flight response, all that sort of stuff. So that's the journey that I went on if I was on Strictly. I've, been, I've, been, uh, I've been quite <laughs> conscious of it since, you've, uh, since I've read the book. Mm. I, I can see it now actually mm. popping up a lot mm. more. I hear it in my language mm. as well, and I, it makes me just stop and think, is there a better word? And in, in terms of better words, in I because at Leon you call customers guests, mm. which I thought was lovely, and the, the people that run the stores are like mum and dads yeah. and are there any other examples of the language that you use as a counter to that narrative? Well I think I think you've elevated to the constructs that, that one uses. It's very easy to think well surely what else is there right because surely business is war. We're so ingrained to think of business as war. You think well what other contrasts mate can you use and I think interesting the two that we find most useful and it it slightly depends on whether you're a maximizer or a minimizer. And certainly, if you look at the Taoism, Taoism has lots of language that you can use other than the military language. So it has the uh, metaphor of war. So if you look at uh, the Watercourse Way, which is um, an explanation of Taoism by Alan Watts, or even if you consider yourself a gardener, there are all sorts of metaphors that you can use which are equally valid, mm -hmm. just as consistent, in fact, probably more powerful, mm -hmm. uh, probably more kind to the people that work there. So. The two that we know, we tend to use the um, water analogy, which tends to be for those people that sort of start, begin, correct, adjust in that kind of total quality self readjustment kind of way. Then there's the people who are more like a tree, you know, they're the minimizer, they have their intent, they're the sort of acorn and they grow slowly, mm -hmm. like tortoise and hare kind of analogy. And then there's, has anyone read Gung Ho at all? Uh, yeah, you have, okay, yeah. There was a woman who was given a, a task in a factory in America to turn around a factory that was failing. And she thought, I, this is a, like, you know, uh, there's no way I can succeed here. And she went to the one department that was working, which was the finishing department, and she said to the, the, actually the man who worked there, how come you're successful? He said, well, my grandfather was a native American, and he said, you know, think about squirrel, beaver, goose, think about the spirit of the squirrel, the way of the beaver, and the gift of the goose. And she said, look, Squirrel gets nuts. Everyone needs to know they need to get nuts. <laughs> the beaver self-assembles. Uh, no one really asks the beaver to do this or that. They, they self-assemble. And then the gift of the goose is like the geese that honk the leader. And the leader changes, but everyone honks and it's find all those little things to celebrate. And so she applied that principle to the whole factory and it worked. There was no need for military analogy. There was no need for let's kill the competition. So I think adopting those sorts of constructs end up making the business actually more resilient. And it's those sorts of constructs that might be more helpful. 
And what I really love is this, this stuff is in action in Leon. Mm. So we talk about it. And my understanding from reading the book yep. is that there are these four doors. And one of the mm. first doors that people go into that you, in, in um, mm. Wing Chun is becoming mm. conscious. Mm. Um, and so that's sort of like the first step for mm. people. And you talk in there about knowing yourself. Mm. So the importance of knowing yourself, mm. which I think in terms of what Sarah and I do at Amazing mm. If is a massive part of we talk to people about if you know your values and you know your strengths mm. and you can apply that to work, then you can help to design mm. a career that works for you. In Knowing Yourself in the book, mm. you talk about the, I'm going to say this wrong, the Enneagram, Enneagram? You can call it that. Okay, I'll put a link on the website, everybody, <laughs> you can find it. Some people call it the Enneagram, <laughs> you know, some people use different <laughs> words. Well, we'll yeah. call it the Enneagram. Shall we? Now. Let's yeah, do it. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. it <laughs> uh, and so this is a tool that you can get. You can get it free online and it has a number of different questions and it's sort of like a model of mm. human psyche mm. and it has one of nine different traits which people might be familiar with sort of personality tools from sort of Myers-Briggs. It's a, it's a different one to that and I know that you could talk about the roots of it coming from different places. Um, and I had done it before as one of our daily squiggly career tips for anyone that follows us on mm. Instagram and I read it having read in the book. Mm. So there are nine different programs Profiles that you can be. So you are, let me get this right, you are a seven with a wing of an eight. No, you're an well, eight with a wing of correct, a seven, correct, that's correct, it. Correct, correct. You're an eight with a wing, which makes you a maverick. Right. Is that right? right. And, and I, when I did mine, yeah. I was the opposite of you. So I was a seven with a wing of an eight, which makes me an opportunist. Right. So I was thinking, oh, maybe we're some, uh, in, some, uh, in some way similar. I'd yeah. just like to, yeah. you know, like, I'd like to adopt your yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so the Enneagram as a personality test, how do you go from people doing a personality test to that being something that works at work and makes people work differently or better? Has anyone done the Enneagram? I must admit, when I started working at PNG, I was not the biggest fan of these things because, you know, no one likes to be pigeonholed, right? Because mm -hmm. we're all individuals. I'm not. But the, the challenge, I guess, is that the Enneagram was probably, not definitely, but probably developed by the Sufis. So the, uh, the mystics, the, okay. from, from, from uh, the Muslim mystics. And what I love about it is that it is deep in its, the gift that it gives you in terms of what you might call spiritual development. Let's, call, let's use the word spiritual. It is probably the biggest breakthrough that someone has at Leon when they understand themselves. I remember we did a focus group before we started Leon and one of our friends, Dave Brown, he said, you know what, I thought it was fascinating. The most fascinating bit I found was the bit where I was talking about myself. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and so what we find is that, um, you know, people love the session where they're looking inside because I mean, we know, we know galaxies and we know stars and we all taught all this stuff at school about history, and, but we're not ever taught about ourselves. It's not something we ever, uh, isn't it? We're given no map of who we are. And suddenly, when you do the Enneagram, suddenly you're like, wow, look at this map, it's a map <laughs> of me. Um, and it deals with the conscious and it also deals with your unconscious and your shadow. And it deals with the archetypes that you create. So what's really interesting is that fundamentally, three types are predominantly driven by shame, right? So if, as you've been growing up, you have been told, I value you because of the, the certificate I put on the fridge, right? Some of you may be able to empathize with that. Three of the types are driven by anger, and that's my type. Uh, and the Enneagram 8 can either be Nelson Mandela or Saddam Hussein. Um, three are driven by fear. And so that might sound incredibly negative, but what it does say is that when you're actually going through the first door, it's incumbent upon you to know, understand what you might call your ego, which is a slightly different terminology from the way that maybe Freud or Jung called ego, but it's the bit which is most readily inflamed and most readily put into a fight flight response. I know sometimes people might equate it with the chimp and the chimp paradox, but it's fundamentally the bit of us which wants to respond with aggression under pressure. And sometimes we hate most feeling embarrassed and shameful. Some of us are driven by just a general sense of anger and frustration. And some people are driven by just fear of fear. Stress at work, it's been one of the most popular podcasts we've mm. done is on stress. and. I just wondered if you've got any perspective on how you're helping people with that at Leon mm. that other people might be able to learn from and apply in their own careers and businesses. Um, I think you talked earlier about with you know Dan up here about the roller coaster and you gave examples of the ups and the downs. And I think 
the one story which we teach Leon people is the story of Choi. I don't know whether anyone's heard it, but it's the basically it's a story of the man who had very poor, who had one possession, and it was a horse, and he was taking it to the market, and it ran away. And the neighbours said, "Oh my God, Choi, you're so unlucky." And Choi said, "Well, maybe." And then the next day, uh, the horse came back with two wild horses, and the neighbours said, "Oh, you're so lucky." And Choi said, "Well, maybe." And then the next day his son broke his leg trying to tame one of the horses. And the neighbour said, oh, you're so unlucky. And Choi said, maybe. And then the next day, uh, the army came to try and take his son away, but they couldn't because he'd broken his leg. And the neighbour said, oh, my God, you're so lucky. Choi said. <laughs> 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 so I think that the, the judgment that we apply to any one situation and the, the choice we make about whether this is the top of the roller coaster experience or the bottom is really built into the, the, the Wing Chun fighting art, which is whatever your opponent does is to your advantage and your job is to de-escalate uh, the situation. So I think that once you understand that if someone is having road rage and you've cut them up and they wind their window down, probably five years ago, I'd have wanted to get out and have a bit of a ruck. Um, <laughs> but now I, I apologise and say, you know, I'm so sorry, I'm so bad at driving. And they go, oh, all right, mate, all right, no worries. Um, and it's just, it's just that kind of, uh, it's that kind of tool that I guess that we teach people, which is don't let your insecurities uh, get in the way of your relationships with anybody. It's incumbent upon us to give them the, the mind maps and the kind of omega three and all that supplement stuff that Dan does um, uh, um, in order to cope. Still recommend your fish wrap first, oh, don't no, worry. Thank you, thank <laughs> you, thank you, thank you. Fish you, wraps, thank omega threes, I, I love you, it. Um, the panel is going to come together in a second to recommend more than fish wraps and omega threes, yeah, yeah. I promise. Yeah. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much for sharing oh, that with you. us. It's such an insightful, as I said, calming, reflective, applicable book. Um, and yeah, I recommend it to everybody out in November. Thank you so much Thanks for sharing with me. us, John. Thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, we asked everybody over on Instagram, LinkedIn, they knew who was coming and they were, we got loads of questions, so I'm going to have to pick two or three that I think will be most interesting. The first one, which I think is fascinating, is what was your first job, so the first time you were paid to do something, and then what was your first proper job? Because usually they're not the same thing. So I was saying to Pitt before, my first job where I was paid money was doing tennis coaching on a Saturday morning in cash, £18 an hour, which I still wow, think now is really yeah. actually really good. When I look back at it, I'm like, oh yeah, that was like really decent money. <laughs> so like two hours on Saturday morning, absolute winner. And my first ever proper job was at Boots, which is where Helen and I met in Nottingham 18 years ago. Those now. are the days. So there you go, there's, there's, there's kind of my two. So Simon, first paying job, first proper job? Uh, first paying job was a car washing round I did from about the age of 10. First actual job uh, was a holographer which was creating those deep holograms, the, the green ones where you get yeah. the lights on it and whatever. You know, I, it allowed me to do really cool Christmas cards for because I could do actually 3D Christmas yeah. cards with my face and things like that. <laughs> How did that go? Perks of the yeah. job that uh, you weren't meant to. Pip, what was your first cash in hand or pocket? Yeah, job? so first cash one, and we were chatting about this earlier, was um, was in Tesco's. But I worked out that if you work the night shift in Tesco, so I was working in the canteen that served the truckers that delivered all the stuff to Tesco's, you got paid three times the amount of it per hour. So I'd start at roughly about six and I'd finish at like three, four in the morning and then go back. So that was my first cash job and I guess my first proper job is I was an economist. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> Dan? Um, first job, uh, football coach. Um, and then uh, first proper job, well I graduated in the recession so whilst in theory like my first proper job was in advertising I worked in a pub for a year um, <laughs> which is not what my parents aspirations were at the time but frankly even if I'd have gone to Cambridge I'd have been putting pints in a pub for a year. Jim? Uh, from age 14, I um, did every, every holiday. I worked at the Old Bailey as uh, a crime reporter. That was um, your first then, job as yeah, a 14 year old? Yeah. Okay, I mean, that sounds like a whole other podcast, so you know. <laughs> it was the 80s! <laughs> yeah. You were allowed to do that sort of stuff. Right, okay. <laughs> so, just to finish off, final question, uh, just a quick answer from each of you. 
Um, with all everybody who's listening, uh, we talked a lot about loads of different ways of making work better. What's your kind of one piece of advice you give to everyone listening in terms of making their work life better? John, let's perhaps start with you. Um, I think that we are most happy when our relationships are positive at work. And I think stress doesn't come from a situation. I think stress comes from the potential toxicity of relationships. So I would say judge people's actions by by their insecurities, not by your insecurities. And don't inflame the situation by bringing those into play. Great. Pip? Oh my God, I'm going to link to that and just say smile. Um, I know it's like the simplest thing in the world. I've been really lucky that my teeth are actually bigger than my mouth, so I'm, I actually always have had to smile my whole life. But weirdly, I also read about it, and you know, obviously, the more you smile, it actually tricks your brain into thinking happy. And also, smiles are infectious. And you know that like angry person in the street or in the car, and you're having—if you smile at them, they'll smile back. And so it diffuses quite political situations. And so, yeah, I'm the weirdo who sits at my computer writing emails, smiling because they sound more <laughs> happy, and people tend. To respond more like or respond advice. Advice. Yeah, very good. Dan? I mean, it'd be perfectly on brand to follow on with a message because I did a talk um, on laughter and resilience and with all the science of um, how laughter actually, how you can tactically use it. You can watch when you're at your most extreme stress levels. We talked about muscle earlier. Um, you can put on a comedy, whatever your favorite comedy is, and watch it for 20 minutes and have a laugh. And it whether you consciously want to or not, literally teaches your body to uh, relax at that moment of stress. And if you experience that kind of stress level again in that same way, your body physiologically doesn't react the same way. So in my last business, you know, we had 45 people and whenever we were doing anything stressful, we made them go and literally take 20 minutes out, watch whatever you want to watch, but it's got to be a comedy. Ah, that's um, really good. And it really works. specific bit of advice. Simon? Uh, f well, for me, I've always said we're going to have a cap of 50 people in the business. Okay. Um, so I know them. And if you know each person, you know what's going on, you know what's happening in their lives, and you understand the, the person, so it's the, it's the whole. And then at work we can wrap the role around the person, and outside of work we can react to their life challenges and understand them. And I've worked in a company before with 5,000 people and you're just numbering it, actually there's no joy in it, as far as I'm concerned, in running a business. Thank you. Um, so that is the end of tonight's podcast. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you to everybody who is listening to tonight's podcast. We've mentioned uh, books, businesses, products, information. It will all go on the website. So we'll do a post to accompany tonight's conversations and this episode. And you can find all the links there. So you'll find everything. Um, big thank you to coming. Big thank you to listening. If um, you have friends that don't know about Squiggly Careers and you think it might help them in their careers, please do. Our mission is to make work better for everybody. And we seem to be helping people by lots of people sharing it, so please be part of that. Um, if you get chance as well, reviews are really helpful to the Apple algorithm. Um, <laughs> really, really helpful. So we have, I think, 151 reviews at the moment, five-star reviews. It doesn't have to be five stars. Uh, but if you like it, if you like it, um, please do leave us a review. It really helps us to reach more people. Thank you very much for coming, and a huge, huge round of applause to tonight's guests. Thank you very much for your time.